Our first speaker is Bill von Hippel. He is the head of the School of Psychology at the University of Queensland. Bill came out of Yale and he got his PhD from the University of Michigan. He's published over 80 papers concerned with the evolutionary psychology, self-regulation, ageing, stereotyping and prejudice. And he's a fellow of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Berlin. Ladies and gentlemen, to help you understand why we leave our pants in the hallway, Bill von Hippel. Thank you all very much. I, I fear I'm going to come across as the nerdy academic after that introduction. <laughs> I can't possibly live up to all the pants in the hallway stuff, but I'll do my best. Um, what I'd like to do, we're going to do a couple of brief scientific experiments today of which you'll be part. Uh, the first one we're going to start in a moment, but let me just give you a tiny bit of background about what this first one is about, and then we'll give it a crack. Basically, um, I'm sure, I assume that all of you are aware that there are anatomical differences between men and women. Um, <laughs> you're, you're probably quite familiar with that, but, but what you might not be aware of is the fact that there are also, as a consequence, psychological differences between men and women. Now, when I say that there are anatomical differences, th that's on average, right? There's a wide variability in what men look like and a wide bit of variability in what women look like, but there's certain differences that you can count on. And psychologically, it looks much the same that these biological differences have actually created psychological differences. And sometimes they create these psychological differences through hormonal factors, sometimes they create them through genetic factors. But in all cases, and all the stuff I want to discuss with you tonight, what, when I tell you that there are these psychological differences, I'm speaking in general, and I'm not saying that this is how it has to be. And so your genes don't determine you how you are. You're, Psychological history doesn't determine how you, is, how you are. It simply nudges you in that direction. But we'll take a look at some of those nudges and see where it takes us. Um, so what I'm first going to do is have you vote on some, uh, I'm going to show you some pictures of men and women, and I'm going to ask you to decide uh, who is more attractive in each pair. And then after we've made those decisions, I'll go through how it is that we, um, how it is that we created them and, and what these votes tell us. And basically, one of the important anatomical differences between males and females, and there are many, but one of them is the difficulty of creating offspring. Now, for men, it's, it's very easy to create a baby. Men create millions and millions of sperm every day. Um, they might as well use them as not. And if they, could find a, a friend, if they could find a friendly place to put their sperm, they've got a decent chance of creating an offspring. And really, their job could end right there. For females, for women on the other hand, it's, it's a much more dip difficult proposition. If they decide to have a baby, they're going to be at least, a, uh, typically about nine months of gestation, which particularly in an ancestral environment where food was hard to come by was a big ask. And then in ancestral environments, you typically have anywhere from two to four years of lactation, which also is a big ask in an ancestral environment where there's not enough food to come by. I remember when my son was born, it was like watching a liposuction machine attached to my wife, just sucking the fat right out of her. It was extraordinary. And he, he's just turning into a balloon. And this would have been a very difficult thing for our ancestors to do when they were food stressed, when they had trouble getting enough to eat. So that is an important biological difference that has led to important psychological consequences in what men and women are looking for in a partner. Because for men, it's relatively easy to reproduce, and that leads to one set of standards. For women, it's a huge effortful process to reproduce, and that, that leads to another set of standards and goals. On average, women are going to be more concerned about the quality of their partner than men are. The men, are going to, <laughs> men are going to compete for the affections of women, because women are providing an, a very important resource, a huge amount of effort and time to raise this offspring that men need only put a tiny bit amount of effort and time into, at least at the minimal level. And so, and this is something that we'll see across the animal kingdom. It was Robert Trivers who first pointed this out in the early 70s, and it really lines up the mating strategies of pretty much almost all the animals that we know about, humans included. And so, but, but what that means is that women are looking for the perfect partner. And what that perfect partner is going to be is somebody who has great genes, because of course we know the genes are passed on to the offspring, and somebody who's going to be really helpful in 
taking care of those offspring that are, that are produced. Um, in today's world, of course, if you're a single mother, you're reasonably confident your child will grow to adulthood. But in hunter-gatherer societies, children who are born without a father present had less of a chance of surviving to adulthood. And so women are not all, they're looking for great genes in their partner, and they're also looking for somebody who's really going to be helpful and help them raise their partner. Uh, how, how are we doing? Because I'm getting to where we could really use a vote here. <laughs> um, we're good? OK. We're going to try it again. Maybe, um, do you want to control it from back there? Do you think that might give us more luck? So why don't we try that? All right, so the number will appear in a moment. All right, and then it'll, beautiful. Yay. Please. <laughs> Please push a one or a two to indicate your gender. Did it appear, did you guys see the little numbers come up? Excellent. Oh, I'm, I was starting to get a little nervous there. <laughs> All right, now I'll, I'll take over. Okay, so now, oh, she's already there. What, I what I'm going to do, what you're going to see are two images that look awfully similar. Don't worry about exactly how they're different. Just you decide which one you find more attractive, OK? And so you'll note that one says 1A and one says 2B, and it'll be like that all the way through. As soon as I push the button, the number will again appear on the screen, and then please vote, OK? Push your clicker to see which one you find more attractive. Choose the one that you find better looking. So I'm going to go ahead and control it, OK? Perfect. So now you've got the 10 seconds to vote on your preferred image. Which of those two? And I know they look very similar. Don't worry about that. OK. We're going to go on to the next one. This is the scientific experiment I, I forewarned you about. Again, same story. Just please indicate, now that the numbers are going, which one you find more attractive. Oh, no. Did it, did it work? All right, push hard. Be strong with these clicker pads. <laughs> Something's conspiring up here. I'll leave it open, whatever it is. All right. Um, let's try the next one. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push it. You'll get a number. Again, 1A if you think she's more attractive, 2B if you think she's more attractive. Are they working? OK, thank God. All right. Last one of the women we're going to rate. Same story. OK, now we're going to shift gears a little bit. You get to choose between these two guys. Sadly, neither of them are here tonight. We'll go on to the next one. All right, please vote again. Not working? Push it hard. Okay. I'll start up the timer. OK, last one. OK, hopefully most of you were able to vote. Um, now, what, do we ha what did I do here? This is actually a research project that's currently underway that Rob and I are collaborating with a number of other people at the University of Queensland looking at the genetics of attraction. And you guys get a sneak preview of it, so to speak. And what we did is the following. The, um, whenever you saw a woman, she was morphed either with number 16 or with number 5 to 20%. So it was her actual face, 80% of the image, and then it was morphed 20% with those two extremes. Whenever you saw a man, it was morphed either with number 2 or with number 10. So you never actually saw the real people in any of those images. What you saw was morphed, images that were morphed in the two different directions. Now, the way these morphs work, this is a, what, what you see here, that's actually a long series of morphs. None of those are an actual individual. 
but they're morphing from a high testosterone face at number two all the way down to a high estrogen face at number 16. Now estrogen caps bone growth, and so what'll happen is a high estrogen face will be very round, like she is. Take number 16 as the extreme example. It causes um, people to lay down fat on the cheeks and lips, um, and it, it gives that impression of very large eyes as well. And so that's a high estrogen female face. Testosterone does lots of things, just like estrogen, but one of the things that it does is it leads to a very characteristic bone growth in the face with that big square jaw and angular face that that guy has in number two. So what we did is we manipulated the degree to which those images either communicated, in the case of females, a high estrogen female or a relatively low estrogen female, and in the case of males, a high testosterone male or a low testosterone male. So now we're going to take a look at your votes and see who it is that you prefer. And despite the debacle of actually getting a vote to happen, I'm desperately hoping you guys show us what we know to be the case in the literature so I can <laughs> continue forward with my planned lecture and I won't have to ad lib it. Okay, so what we see here, I'm so proud of you guys, this is a relief. <laughs> what we see here is uh, a uniform preference for the female face over the, uh, I'm sorry, for the high estrogen, for the high estrogen female face, the more feminine, I'll just call it the more feminine female face, we see a, a uniform preference where on average across two-thirds of the images of women, both men and women like the more feminine face than the less feminine face, than the more masculinized face. I'll come back to that. What we see in the case of the men is an... Ah, interesting. <laughs> Not what I expected, you people. Um, we see among the women in this audience an even greater preference for the high masculine men. Well, I think this is revealing, and it may have something to do with the fact that it's Valentine's Day. And it, <laughs> it, it also suggests to me that a number of you women are ovulating, so you might keep that in mind. Um, the, uh, and the men show less of a preference on that one, which um, I actually wasn't quite sure what the men were going to do. Well, let's back up and talk about why this might be. Basically, although finding the perfect man is very important for women because of the effort that they put into procreation, whereas finding the perfect women is not so important for men because the act is, can be quite quick and that can be the end of your job, um, nevertheless, women are actually put in a bit of a bind. And I hate to break this to you, but I'll tell you right now, there is no such thing as the perfect man. <laughs> and, and the reason why there's no such thing is it all comes down to testosterone. Now, testosterone is both good and bad, and that's why there's no perfect solution to this problem that women have faced for millennia. And basically, what this problem is, is testosterone leads to a number of consequences. It makes men more muscular, it gives them that characteristic jaw that you're looking at right there, and it also is an immunosuppressant. And so high testosterone men, men who grow a jaw like that, and typically the muscles that accompany it, have weaker immune systems than low testosterone men. Now that means that testosterone is something like a peacock's tail. You know, when a peahen sees a peacock with that massive tail, she says to herself, wow, any, any peacock that could generate a tail that large and not get eaten by a tiger has got to be a pretty special peacock. He's got to be pretty quick on his peacock feet, right, to get away in life with that massive handicap. And also, he has to be pretty fit to produce such a big and beautiful thing. Well, the same holds for testosterone. When women look at men who are high testosterone, they know that they're looking at high genetic quality because you will not survive to adulthood with testosterone levels like he has unless you've got a very good, robust genetic system to survive that immunosuppressing effect of the testosterone. Do you follow me? Yep. And so as a consequence, when women are looking for genetic quality, they know that they see it when they see a face like that. They go, that's high genetic quality. If he made it to adulthood looking like that, he's a robust organism, <laughs> okay? Now, the, and, as, and what that means is that particularly in environments where there's greater pathogen prevalence, women value testosterone even more. So we know from a recent study uh, that looked at test preferences for these kind of images that I showed you around the world that it, places like Jamaica where there's high risk of pathogen or high pathogen prevalence, women are particularly likely to go for that guy because that's when it really matters. He's showing you his genetic quality. And in fact, we know from research that comes out of a couple of different laboratories that even just getting women to worry about diseases 
moves them toward that guy. But, and I probably don't need to tell you this, there's problems with that guy. Um, <laughs> testosterone doesn't just lead you to, um, you know, it doesn't just lead to high quality and big muscles and, and end of story, because that's a perfect outcome. We, if that were true, all men would be these big, high testosterone guys, or at least whoever could pull it off. Testosterone has other consequences as well. One of the things is it causes men to be more interested in sexual novelty, which means that pairing up with a high testosterone guy is a risk that he may not be there tomorrow or next week or maybe next year. The second thing about high testosterone is that it also leads to a high level of aggressiveness. And so high testosterone guys are going to be less likely to be good dads, do the nurturant kind of thing that you want to do. And so by virtue of, their, of the hormone testosterone pushing men to be more aggressive, pushing them to have more sexual interest in novelty, it makes them not such a reliable partner. And remember, I told you that women want good genes to give to their offspring, but they also want help. They need somebody who's going to help uh, with the child rearing and bringing home resources and things like that. And so there's a real risk that that guy's not going to come through for you. So that kind of cute baby-faced guy on the left, he is probably much more likely to bring home the day's earnings for you to share with him. And he's probably far less likely to wander as he looks around um, at other possibilities because he is a much more low testosterone face. And so what that does is it forces women into what we call a dual mating strategy where they've got to go with in one direction or another, and neither is the perfect direction. The low T guy may not be a very robust organism, so he may not give you the best genes, but he'll probably stick around and help you raise the kids. The high T guy, he's probably a pretty robust organism, but you can't count on him to stick around. And so in this very important decision that our female ancestors have been making for millennia, there was no right answer. There was neither A nor B. And what that, what that leads to, or what we suspect that it leads to, is actually um, women not only pursue this dual mating strategy in that they have to have an A or B, but sometimes our ancestral women seem to have wanted to have their cake and eat it too. And what that meant was marrying the guy on your left, but then sneaking off with the guy on the right. <laughs> And there's good evidence that this happens in the two different domains, and, or uh, lots of different evidence, but I'll give you two examples. First, when women are ovulating, which is why I raised that issue earlier, no matter what their preferences are, they shift in the direction of the guy on the right. So if you love Leo DiCaprio, you move a tiny bit toward, I don't know who would be a little bit to more T than him, but you move a little bit in a Schwarzeneggerian direction. <laughs> um, if you like um, Arnold to begin with, then you like the super mega Arnold when you're ovulating. Now, that only holds when women are not on birth control pills. You need the natural hormonal cycle to get these effects. And of course, it holds whether women know that they're ovulating or not. Now, the second piece of evidence, um, I won't actually ask you to do this, but the piece of evidence can be found in the pants of all the men in this room. Um, and that is that our testicles are larger than they need to be. Um, if you look at the testicles of gorillas, who when there's one big silverback, he mates with all the females and has no competition, they're tiny little things. It doesn't take much testicle to do the job. And for those of you who have a pair, you know that landing on them when you're learning to ride a bike or any other circumstance is a terribly uncomfortable thing to do. They're swaying out there in the breeze because they have to be temperature controlled, and they're, they're delicate objects. You want them to be as small as they possibly can be to do the job at hand. But because our ancestral mothers and grandmothers all the way back have been occasionally sneaking off, particularly when ovulating and would do them the most good, we men have had to grow larger testicles than we need in order to, and I know this doesn't sound very romantic on Valentine's <laughs> Day, so forgive me, but basically in order to wash out the male who was there before you. And this is called sperm competition. Rather than competing at the level of, you know, you choose me and not him, human males can't guard their females all the time. Ovulation is what we call cryptic. We don't know when our partners are fertile. And so a strategy that we've evolved over time to deal with that problem is to grow bigger testicles than we need just in case uh, she might have been sneaking off. And in fact, we now know that when men uh, are first with their partner, after they've had an absence away from each other, the amount of fluid that comes out of them is increased, um, in part to achieve that unromantic job. So. <laughs> My apologies for that. Now, the good news about testosterone, and I'll, I'll go through that rather quickly, is that, um, that it's not only does it influence our behavior, but it's influenced by our behaviors as well. 
And so the one thing that really tames men is having a, real, a stable partner. When, when men become partnered up, especially if they're not looking anymore, their testosterone goes down. And when they have babies, their testosterone goes down even more. Because you don't want this, your body coursing with this novelty-seeking aggressive hormone when you've already achieved your evolutionary goal of creating the offspring that you really ought to be now helping take care of. So when we were doing some testosterone work in my lab, just out of curiosity, I sent mine off. And so I've got all these 18-year-old college students data up here, and there was my number down here, like a 12-year-old girl. And <laughs> I was dismayed. I was like, there's got to be a mistake here. And my wife said, nope, I take this as very good news. Don't worry about it. I'm happy to see that your testosterone levels are through the floor. So on the, on the other side of the equation, though, um, remember that uh, what women are faced with this dual mating strategy. Well, men are actually in a happy situation where they don't have to make this trade-off because reliably men go for the high estrogen phases because there doesn't seem to be an ancestral problem of too much estrogen, although that can lead to infertility. It seems to be the case that on average, women in our women, at least in the world that we live in, are on the side of if there's any risk of infertility, it's not, it's insufficient estrogens. And so men and women in general tend to prefer those, um, those female faces that um, communicate um, high levels of estrogen, the high femininity faces. And there, there doesn't seem to be a real trade-off where men, men are in the happy position of not really caring in the first place, but to the degree that they care, they seem to get what they want because the main thing that men will be looking for in a partner is fertility. And on average, what, this is the face that communicates fertility. I, I suppose there could be a hyper-estrogen face that would be on the far side of fertility, but that doesn't seem to have been a problem that we faced. Okay? So this is the basic story about how hormones influence what we're after, both our own circulating hormones, because of course, for both men and women, the circulating presence of testosterone and estrogen changes their preferences, but largely how hormones are then reflected in the faces of the people that we see. Now, am I, am I all right on timing? Okay, so what, what we're gonna do now, I know that scientific experiment one was a bit of a debacle, <laughs> although we finally did get it to work. What we're gonna do now is scientific experiment two, which is far riskier in the sense that it requires a lot of cooperation from you guys, but it's gonna be integral to Professor Brooks's talk uh, when I'm finished. So what we'd really like you guys to do, we're going to hand out a series of numbers and we'll put them face down on your table or we'll put them into your palms face down. It's very important that you don't look at the number that we give you. It'll just be a number on a piece of paper. So please play ball with us, humor us if you will. You don't have to take part of this experiment if you don't want. We're only going to be able to do it down here on the floor. So if you are up there and you'd like to be involved, please feel free to come down. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to give you a number. Please keep it face down in your hand. And once everybody has a number, everybody who'd like to be involved, we're going to ask you to, um, your, the, the trick is you, can't, you can never know your own number, but you're going to display it to others. So for the moment, you'll keep it face down in your hand. Well, I was waiting. Yes? I have a question. Sure. Yes. Does it change perhaps after pregnancy when you look at it? And does it change after menopause? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. There's some re very recent research that suggests it does change after menopause. Um, the problem is that menopause is a very interesting problem um, because you, you could ask yourself, why bother living after you're no longer reproductively viable? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I would never ask that question, but you could. Um, and uh, there's some very interesting data that suggests that grandparents are critical in the survival of humans. That menopause has a very good reason. It stops women from reproducing on their own when their body would hardly be able to keep doing it anymore. And then putting in this very long-term investment, they can now turn their investment into their children's children. And I'll have you know, by the way, that you mothers are sneaky people and you grandmothers. You start to invest in your daughter's children because you don't trust your son's wives. And you're not sure who's those who those grandchildren really belong to. But you know that your daughter's children, whatever she might have been up to, are hers. And that's where grandparents seem to put their most effort, into the children of their own daughters. And that seems to be part of the reason for menopause. In fact, in, um, we know in 15th century Finland, for example, that you're more likely to survive to adulthood if you had grandparents who were available to help take care of you. All right, does everybody have a number? Fabulous. OK, so now what we're going to do is this. What I'd like you to do, please don't peek at your number at all, but put it on your forehead so the rest of the world can see it, okay? And, and, and try to put your fingers on the very edge so that it's visible. 
And now some of your numbers are sideways and stuff, but that's okay. Now what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to look around and stand up, and I want you to all try to pair with the person who has the highest number on their head possible. Now everybody, it's all monogamy. You can only pair with one person. So I'd like you to get up and move around. And the way you pair is you, you clasp hands. That's an agreement that you're now married. So your goal is to marry the person with the highest number possible. So please move around. Don't look at your own number and try to find someone with the highest number possible. Girls can be with girls, boys with boys, anything you want. But try to find the highest number that you can get to partner up with you. And once you've part, no, only two, only two in a pair. And once you've partnered, you can shake hands and now indicate that you're done. If you're partnered, you can, once you partner off, you can take your number off your head and indicate that you're done. We're going to have a brief break. That's, that'll be the end of my part of the presentation. After the brief break, Rob will take over.